Most of you have only seen these things from a distance or from beyond the rope. And here we are coming into such close proximity of the site that I must remind you yet again to do be very careful with the walls and the floor surfaces that we have here. Because there, just beyond the chain, there are some very unique and original and fragile archaeological resources. But don't pay attention to them right now, okay? We'll look at them in a minute. For now, we are going to consider this place, the Longhouse, a wonderful archaeological site. Take those artifacts away. And Gustav left his numbering system here, where you saw the number 15, the number 15 over there, and there's one more. Did anybody else see the third number 15 that's here? Come on, guys, what's wrong? Nobody had breakfast? No, no, it's okay. Here, small number 15, right here, okay? And we tell visitors, and um, the new brochure, the real cool little updated brochure, it says in there that this was a Gustav Nordenschuld number. And he left these in these places after he studied here. But we're combing the archives right now, looking for a brochure from a very early time that would have had these numbering systems, not as Gustav Nordenschuld had them, but rather as a very part of the very first early tours to this place before it's a part. Because the Wetherills began tourism. They began to guide people and lead them up here. And then at least two other known individuals, both from Mengos and from Cortez, are known to have guided people up here on horseback and allowed them to dig. And this numbering system, the number 15, it might have been part of one of those early tours where people are on horseback. You go to the number 15 house and we set you free for two hours or for the rest of the evening and you're allowed to dig up whatever you want. And then we're off to number 16 on this archaeological adventure. So Gustav Nordenschuld writes about these numbers in his book, The Cliff Dwellers of Mesa Verde, as if they are already there. But that's something we have to consider. But we just reprinted those books. It'll probably be another 20 years before they're printed again. So they say they're Gustav Nordenschuld numbers, but I want you to be aware of this, okay? Now, because Gustav was a European, he wasn't an American, and he shipped off roughly 600 objects, including skeletal remains. They end up in Helsinki, Finland. People get angry, and they arrest him, but they can't do anything about it. It's not against the law what he did. So they changed and created the way we interact with these places. The American Antiquities Act, 1906 and 1907, and Mesa Verde coming under federal law. So here we are at this place that is now under federal protection. The trees, the plants, the little artifacts that are about out there are all protected by federal law. This is wild, right? Because we had people coming here and shoveling out whatever they wanted. And now we have to be on a tour. So, it goes to show you how change is happening. But quickly, returning back to the ancestors. The whole point of people living in this dry climate, the whole reason they're around, that there's actually cliff dwellings for you to see, that there's human history at 7,000 feet in the desert, is because of the existence of a very special and very fundamental element of human life. Right over there, the green stuff, you see? The water that's contained from the soil. This is a seep spring. This is one of the most heavily modified seep springs out of any other in the entire park, and we'll go see it next. But above us was 100, 120 feet of sandstone that absorbs water. Water comes into it when it rains, and eventually there's a gray area of shale there that interacts with the sandstone on top, and then the water leaches out, and we have a seep spring. These little pockets of water form the basis of human life. Without them, forget about it. So, don't be fooled, okay? The cliff dwellings that you see here now are from the 13th century. That's the last bit of building that was going on here. But these alcove spaces, they were used for much a greater time. If you were all at Step House, then you saw there was 13th century masonry alongside pit houses. From when? Who read the book? 600. Five, 680, something like that. And so it goes to show how long people were using this as farmers. But even before they're farmers, far back into time, thousands of years, the very earliest people, hunters and gatherers, would have been coming to these natural shelters, but also because they cannot survive here. They cannot live here without water. So, guess what? We're not allowed to dig underneath these things because that's inherently quite destructive. When you dig something up, it's very destructive, okay? And underneath these structures, many of them, I'm sure we would come across the older inhabitants of these places. And we have in some, in some cliff lines here, we have a pit house that we dug up that shows you that this space was very uh, much used for an ancient time. But what we're looking at is the remnants of the farming people, okay? 
that moved out of here at the end of the 13th century. They grew, of course, we always talk about this, and I hate this, all right? But this is what you get in public school education in this country. They were growing corn, beans, and squash, okay? And I hate giving the corn, beans, and squash tour. It's too generic. Because we're stuck on corn, beans, and squash. And you know what? Here at Face of Edit, and for those of you who went to Step House, above Step House and below it, the spill off the canyon, there is several terraces, gardens that these people created on the, on the drainages, okay? And there in some of those terraces, still growing right now to this day, are some very cool little underground plants, tubers, we know them as. They're about the size of a thumb, and they don't come from here. They're not native to this land. In fact, these tubers come from a very far away away. You may know them also as potatoes. And if you're familiar with the genealogy of domesticated plant species, then potatoes totally aren't from Ireland, right? <laughs> They're from South America. And so we have a connection to the South American continent through the plants that these people are growing. But yet, we don't bring this to the public. We don't talk about this radical new find. We're stuck on corn, beans, and squash. Help us, please, okay? <laughs> but potatoes, they're connected to a much broader and larger world. And I love when um, people ask, were these Indians in communication with the Indians across the canyon? And I have to answer in this way, you know, I'm like, well, I don't know, but they're growing potatoes from Peru. What do you think? <laughs> so the civilization that was here was extensive. But before the cliff dwelling period, there's huge villages on the mesa top. And if you go down to the flatlands in New Mexico or to the Montezuma Valley around Cortez, there we have some rather extraordinary villages, cosmopolitan centers. Our biggest cliff dwelling is either Cliff Palace or Longhouse with roughly 150 rooms and 22 kivas. That's a cliff dwelling. The villages that were on the flatland covered several acres. They rose to several stories high and they were five, six hundred, sometimes even close to eight or nine hundred rooms large. They had thirty or forty, even up to fifty kivas in those villages. Huge metropolitan centers in the flatlands and we forget about it because we're focusing so much on the cliff dwellings, the tail end of their existence in this region before they moved down south further. And those big villages, archaeologists say, there was things going on there. There was highly specialized knowledge, there was a lot of imported trade goods, shell beads from the coast, scarlet macaws, the actual birds themselves, chocolate, that was a new discovery, copper bells, and so many other things. And here at Mesa Verde, we don't find that large amount of trade goods from far away. Here at Mesa Verde, things are done after those big villages had their heyday, on a much smaller scale. People are probably returning to models of efficiency rather than powerful societies. Like if you go to New Mexico, you go to Chaco Canyon, right? And you see there, there's walls that are not single course masonry, but they extend out three or four feet wide, core and veneer masonry. And they go up, they went up five, six stories high. And some of the kivas there are the largest kivas anywhere. And they could swallow this whole structure up, no problem. And there was a huge civilization that this people were actually part of in the geographic region. But after that heyday of that big flourishing, that big project, things get smaller. They go to a smaller scale. So what could this be, this change from powerful society to efficient one? As Dr. David Stewart says in Anasazi America, when the resources of the landscape, that's the kicker, you know, when the resources of the landscape don't give you much more room to grow, human societies have to respond. And either it's collapse or it's return to efficient models of living. <laughs> I'm in competition now. All right, so we're going to um, question this further, but look here on the floor, okay? There's a, quite a bit of original corn cobs, and that's not the corn cob, the imprint of the corn is on the original floor. I'm talking about what is right beneath our feet. There are these little board holes into the ground, and there's a bunch of them over there and all across the way. And if you were to check, if you were to um, remove all of the moss and the growing green stuff, you would see the drip coming out. And so watch my hands over here, okay? Look, this moss is impressive. You see that? There's quite a bit of water in these walls. And so the people would have done that as well. And if you see some of these little basins, they have tunnels already carved to them. 
that channels water and feeds them. And some of them fill up one and then they overflow into another and so on. And so we have no real way of knowing their social and political organization. And the cliff dwellings may have been a response to climate drying up at this time and an unprecedented amount of people living on these mesas. So how they dished out water, we don't know. Whether this was an open area where anybody could collect from these, we don't know. Or was it a few special people's jobs to collect water and then to save it for further use. And so cliff dwellings, some archaeologists say, were a response to the climate drying up and too many people being on the landscape and then saying, all right, now that you have 400 people at your community, you're not going to be using our spring anymore. <laughs> it could have been possible, but we don't know. So the spring, it is important. The Pueblos and Hopis come here, and they look around from being in this desert for such an ancient time. They say, you know, the buildings are fabulous and cool. They're the work of our ancestors. They show the genius of them. But in the far, far future, the buildings will go back to the earth eventually. They will erode and return and die and complete their life cycle. Because right now, we're keeping them, you know, we're keeping the plug, you know, on, so to speak, with these cliff dwellings. And the Pueblos and Hopis say, the artifacts as well are going to go back to the earth eventually. But the places where human life and life in general is made possible by the existence of water in a desert, this is a remarkable phenomenon, a very religious, spiritual phenomenon. And these places, like you see behind me, become to the Pueblos and the Hopis the most sacred and important parts of this whole gig. Without water, we're all dead. And so we can learn something from these other cultures, you know. Especially since today in the American West, here, my homeland, many of you are just visitors, but I come from here, this is my place, okay? And there's communities that are drying up their water sources. They're having governments or their local governments ship in water with trucks. And uh, forgive me for being quite obvious about it, but there's no government big enough to supply everybody with water that's going to need it in the next coming years. And please indulge me because I'm from this desert and I don't understand some of the ways of the foreigners who have arrived since. I just don't get golf, you know? What's with golf, all right? Seriously. A lot of water on grass that's not from here. And it is but for the enjoyment of a few in this civilization. In the next hundred years, if any water or anybody's left, we're going to look back on this time and say, what were we thinking? This was the dark ages of resource exploitation. Using water we didn't have to play golf. And wash cars, and flush the toilet, and someone else doing your dishes for you. And if you drive over or you fly over some of the communities in the desert, mostly in Arizona, you see all these little round blue things. And what are these? They're swimming pools for individual families. This is impressive. It's crazy. And we can learn something or two from people who have been here for so long. Valuing water as sacred fundamental. And there we have it. Let's go.